Let's speak to Jill Rutter of the UK in a changing Europe, former civil servant as, as well. Jill, thank you very much for joining us. How clear do you think the rules are about MPs doing other jobs? Well, MPs are allowed to do other jobs. They have to declare them. Uh, that's always been part of the rule. And you could argue that uh, we have a cabinet composed mainly of MPs who are doing a pretty full-time job by doing that and get an extra salary on top. So there's never been a rule against doing other jobs uh, as, long as, uh, as long as the constituency is happy, and that really means constituency party. Uh, but there are very clear rules against using the facilities of Parliament, that's one where Labour is complaining to the Standards Commissioner about whether Geoffrey Cox breached that. And obviously, as we saw last week in the Owen Paterson case, there are very clear rules as well against paid advocacy, so taking money from an outside firm and then using your role as an MP to pursue their case with ministers, get meetings and things like that. So the rules are clear, but whether they're being adhered to in the spirit of the rules might be an, another question. But what about enforcement? How strong is that? Is it strong enough? Well, we've, what we've got is the Parliamentary Standards Commission. We saw an attempt last week to uh, to change the system, but uh, that seems to have been aborted in the wake of last week's backlash. So we currently have that system. And one of the things that was quite notable in the uh, statement that uh, Sir Geoffrey Cox put out this morning was that he said you know, he understood this issue as being referred to the Parliamentary Standards Commissioner and uh, that he would abide by any ruling. That's obviously different to Owen Paterson, who was unhappy with the ruling that the Standards Commissioner made. Clearly, it appears that these days, if times have changed, some members of the public don't believe politicians should be having second jobs. What would be lost if they were banned from having second jobs? And what might we need to pay MPs to compensate them for it? Well, I think you're exactly right that that's part of, the, part of the problem. There are some people, particularly people who in previous walks of life have been very high earners, and Geoffrey Cox clearly can command uh, what to many of us would seem to be eye-watering sums for his uh, legal work. Uh, they might be very reluctant to go into Parliament, um, yeah, and there's some others that say that, for instance, you know, uh, Dr. Rosina Allen Khan works as a doctor in A&E, does some shifts there, and she might say that gives her particular insight into the pressures on the NHS, a very different insight to the Prime Minister just walking around uh, a few wards day before. So we might lose that sort of um, that sort of insight. Would we lose a lot if we stopped MPs taking on these directorship roles or these you know, consultant roles, probably not so much, but you might say that we would have fewer people who are prepared to put themselves forward to stand in Parliament, and Parliament then would be a poorer place as a result. But I think where you're absolutely right is there is a debate about should we pay MPs more. The trouble is that's a debate we don't really want to have. We have this agonise every year over MPs' pay rises to... Uh, most people in the country, what MPs are paid seems a really pretty decent salary, sort of 80,000 or so. But the trouble is that for a lot of people who might want to be MPs, that really is much less than they have been used to earning in different walks of life, whether they've been uh, lawyers, or whatever. So it's really quite difficult to, to sort of find a figure that would be sufficient to persuade those people that it's worth becoming MPs, assuming we want those sorts of people to become MPs, but that the public would be prepared to pay. Jill Rutter from um, the UK in Changing Europe. Thank you so much.